To create transparency, we have to draw around the object or paint around the object, not paint the object itself. Let's get started. First, I want to show you what happens if you paint the object. Now, I could have spent a lot more time and made this more accurate. I actually attempted to, but I didn't succeed. But this is painting the object itself. The problem with this is that you don't get transparency. Now let's look at the finished painting before we look at the demo. If you walk away from the computer, you will see that you can see through that cup. You can see that it's translucent. So how do you go about doing that? That's what this video is about. So the first thing you have to do is create a background because the object itself is transparent. So there's going to be a lot of things that you see through the object. So what I'm trying to do during this time is telling myself, whatever you do, don't paint the thing. <laughs> it's so hard to do. Because what I'm trying to, what I have here is I have a size uh, 20 brush. Now, some people have thought that that means it's 20 inches. It doesn't. I think the actual brush is probably an inch and a half wide, and it's a flat. But for some reason, it has the number 20 on it. Someone who knows much more about painting than I do can tell me why that's the case. So the first thing I do is get in a background because I need a neutral color to start with. The next thing I want to do is find some really saturated, really bright saturated spots that I want to leave as emphasizers. You know, obviously the tomatoes are going to be that. And I'm also going to find some places where the glass is really compressed. And so there's more, um, I don't want to say brightness, but saturation. So that's what I'm going to do next. This takes a lot of discipline because, you know, I, I'm the kind of painter and I want to get right at it, you know. Oh boy. And I have painted this cup many, many times and, and done absolutely every single facet of it. But they always end up looking accurate, but kind of dull and lifeless, and I don't get transparency. So that's what I'm interested in now. Simplifying the form, using a few strokes, and getting transparency. So here's some really vivid color coming in now. By vivid, I mean almost pure pigment. There's a, like a turquoise and probably a cerulean blue. I'm looking at those places where the glass is really compressed. So I'm not, it's as if, I'm, but I'm looking through the object. I'm, look, not look, I'm not interested at all in the surface of the object. The next is the tomatoes, which are also quite saturated. And of course, you know, the reason I wanted tomatoes is because, you know, red, the complement of red is green. And I thought that would uh, kick this up a notch. Now what I wanted to do was I wanted to match the value in the t tomatoes with the dark, um, vivid element that I put at the base of the cup. So I had to check that with uh, both my viewfinder and also just using my eyes squinting and making sure it was the same. Because I, I don't want any value confusion, that's for sure. I've got to be really consistent here because I'm going to be making all kind of shift, kinds of shifts. And um, when you have limited strokes, it means that every stroke really matters. So <laughs> the last thing I want to do is um, you know, um, get reckless, you know, or not follow the strategy. So again, I'm just looking at shape and value. And I guess you could argue color at this point. I'm still looking at color. But very quickly, what I'm going to need to do is go into neutrals. The reason for going into neutrals is these really saturated patches that I've put in will only look saturated if everything else is sort of grayed down. So now I have to get busy with graying down my greens because my greens are, um, are not green. They're really grays. So I need to mix some grays that have as much green in them as it's possible to have, but have them still be grays. So um, I'm going to, I think I, oh, okay. I need to find the edge of the plate and establish a shadow underneath, which is a little bit darker than the background color, but keeping it simple. So as few strokes as possible, which is, you know, it sounds easy, but it, it's really hard. It's, 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 uh, yeah, it, it, I shouldn't say hard. I mean, it certainly takes concentration. There, there's no doubt about that in practice. And I'm not saying that I'm great at this yet. This is just something that I'm really interested in doing. So here's my first gray cast shadow going in. And if you compare that probably to the painting where I was painting the actual object is, I got all involved in the various greens. And that's not what this painting is about because it's not about the cup. It's about what you see through the cup. The cup itself doesn't really... I don't want to say it doesn't exist, but in terms of visually, it is clear. 
It just happens to be green and clear. And what I want is transparency. So I've got my established colors in that are really vivid and bright. Now I'm looking at how some grays and I'm needing to grade them down. Here I am checking the value, making sure that the value of this green is probably the same as the gray that I just put in. I want to make sure, and you can see by, because I held the value finder there quite a while, because this is speeded up, I took me a while to make that decision. Um, every decision that I made was made um, carefully, because it's like following a road map. If I start to just sort of get um, goofy, and um, you know, just, just start to make decisions that aren't based on everything that came before, um, things are gonna go awry really quickly. And I hate that feeling. I'm sure you hate that feeling too. You just feel so bad when you paint badly. But it's always a process. What happens for me usually if I paint badly is my next one turns out much better. The trick is not to spend too much time between paintings. You know, get, get back on that horse as quick as you can. So this is a medium gray going in down, but again, it's a gray with quite a bit of red in it and probably some Naples yellow in it as well. So it's quite grayed down. Again, the reason for keeping it grayed down is I want those really vivid, um, you know, bright patches of pigment to show. So everything in relation to that has to be grayer. And I know this is slow going. You know, I'm squinting my eyes and looking at anything that I can see where there's a change or a shift in um, value. So I'm finding all the places where the value appears to, to uh, be this particular mix that I just mixed up. And I'm simplifying it. I'm not finding every single facet in this glass. I'm being very careful not to do that. All right here comes in some Naples yellow that I added probably to the, the mix that I just had so that this will be a little bit lighter because as the you can see on the rim of the plate where things uh, start to turn uh, and have some reflected light that's a little bit lighter right there. So I'm just looking at light and dark, light and dark, light and dark. Now inside the cup, although it looks white, it's not white because you're looking through a green piece of glass. So it has to be a slightly off, uh, off, off, <laughs> off green, but yellower um, mix so that your eye goes down into the cup. So that was a decision. Then I found a couple of other color spots of value along the way that corresponded with that, and I'm using that. Um, and like I said, this is really, really slow going. And at this point, I don't really feel like I've got anything going. I have absolutely no idea if this thing's going to get pulled together or not. But, but in the end, I think, I think it did. Um, now, the main tr I didn't make a dab for every color I use, but keep in mind, everything is grayed down, absolutely everything. Every time that I approach the paper, after putting in those initial bright colors, I, will, I make sure it is grayed down to some extent by putting some of its complementary color into the mix. Otherwise, I won't get transparency. I mean, I know you get transparency from um, light, you know, big juxtaposition between your lights and your darks, but when it comes to this colored glass stuff, it appears to me that you really have to have, um, you really got to learn how to mix these grays because a lot of the time when you're looking through a translucent object, it is gray that you perceive as being color. And my job as a painter is to put the color back in the gray. And yeah, that's a good way of putting it, putting the color back in the gray. So everything that I'm painting with is basically a gray, but I'm putting as much pigment as I can into it so that it will read as a gray, as opposed to um, gray. You know, and, and a good example of a really, really gray thing would be, for example, to make a pencil drawing of this. You know, that's going to be really gray. But I wanted to see how much how much color can I bring into the gray? How much can I simplify the form? How much can I find reflection in those surfaces if I just really stick with my strategy and don't waver and don't overpaint? You know, don't pick up, I would, would not allow myself to pick up a small brush because this, you know, one and a half inch brush, even though it's only an, um, well, this is about seven by 10 inch piece of paper, it feels enormous for this piece of paper. But when I pick up a smaller brush, like a number 16, which is probably about an inch uh, wide, I start getting really, really picky, you know? I mean, as artists, we see so much and we're trained to see so much. 
So it's really hard to see less, but that's what I'm trying to tell myself. And because I'm a certain age, I'm kind of old at this point, one of the things that's to my advantage is I can really squint my eyes <laughs> or take off my, I don't take off my glasses, uh, then things would fly around the studio. But um, it really helps to have to um, see broader things rather than each individual um, detail. You know, I am not interested in the details. And I, I, I salute painters who are. I think it's fantastic to do realistic paintings. It's just not the thing that I'm interested in doing. I'm just so, this is just something that I just get so excited about. You know, the idea of simplifying things just fascinates me at this point in my life. So I'm not telling anybody else what to do. This is just something that I like to do. And um, anytime I learn something about how to get better at doing it, I like to share it with you because it can be so frustrating. I mean, um, you know, the first painting that I showed you where we started off, where I painted the object, I, I mean, I, I always feel like I'm going to burst into tears. You know, I feel like my superpowers are gone. Like, what happened? You know, but the truth is, <laughs> painting is a very up and down kind of experience. You know, of, of course you have consistency over time, but, um, you know, you never know for sure when you sit down if something is going to work or not. You just don't. You have to rely on strategy and, and everything you've learned that came before. And so that's what I try to do. And I, and I also try to tell myself, you know, when something really tanks, you know, I'll say to myself, you know, it's just a painting. Um, get, get right back on. Do it, do it again. Because I almost non-verbally have learned more than I think I have. And so the best time to paint for me is right after I've finished a really bad painting, even though there's no incentive to do it. But, um, but there it is. That's what works for me. And, and you know, you, you do what works for you. Um, now I'm reinforcing those bright, brightest spots one more time and trying to see if there's any place that I left out where I can define the form a little bit better. You know, I wonder if that was a mistake. Boy, when you videotape yourself, videotape, you know, whatever this is, this kind of recording, you know, you can see where, oh gosh, wish I could take that back. But you can't, you know, once it's down there, it's, it's down there. And it's not something that I feel compelled to have to get rid of, but, um, Oh boy, why did I do that over there? Oh good, I toned it down a little bit. That was just, almost wish I had gone a little bit toward, oh boy, I have to sit for half an hour and think about what color that could be. But I guess in the end, I decided to make it a triad, which is a good good way to split the difference. There's some green, some yellow, and a little bit of orange in there, which is probably what the shadow was. It's probably what I actually saw because there would have been cast light from the tomato and cast light from the, um, from the pl plate of the object and from the cup itself. So we're rounding the corner and getting to the end. Um, and I know for those of you who look at this and say, but she didn't paint all of it. And I know, but uh, you know, that's just, that's just what I like to do. Um, and what I'm interested in doing is simplifying forms. And in the end, you know, my goal was transparency and following a strategy. And I think I did that. So, so I feel pretty good about this painting right now. Will I feel good about it tomorrow? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a very, very fickle artist. <laughs> Change my mind all the time. But more importantly, I paint every day. And I think if you paint every day, um, I, I can see progress. And, and that's what really excites me. So, um, so here comes the final uh, thing, which you saw at the beginning when I painted the object. And then, and yeah, it definitely achieved translucence. I'm proud of that. Okay, so remember to keep the whites of your paper white, your paints wet, mass for value, mix for color. Please join my YouTube channel. And I will see you next time. Okay, bye-bye.